Again, I will read the question twice, and then I will call on the, uh, the nominees in the order determined by the casting of cards. The question is, as a bishop who will be engaged in ecumenical situations and conversations, what would you bring to the table distinctly as a representative of the ELCA? The question is, as a bishop who will be engaged in ecumenical situations and conversations, what would you bring to the table distinctly as a representative of the ELCA? Pastor Olson, you will go first. It's a great question, and there's only one answer. When you're dealing with ecumenism and the larger church, every expression of the Church of Jesus Christ, the one thing that we have in common is Jesus. And I would bring my love of Jesus to that office and that conversation. There are many differences between the the different denominations and church bodies that call themselves Christian. There are creedal differences, there are differences in uh, worship and liturgical practices, but the one thing that we have in common is, again, Jesus. And that's not a little thing, that's the everything, and that's the all. So what does that mean? Well, that means that we have to begin by showing kindness to one another and by loving one another sacrificially and perhaps giving up our strong positions for the sake of the world. I never remember uh, reading in any of the gospel passages of Jesus uh, walking and meeting someone on the street and asking them for their identification so they could see what denomination that they're in before healing them and caring for them and breaking bread with them. So that's the one thing that I can bring to the table. I was uh, also had the privilege and pleasure of attending both a Lutheran and uh, an Episcopal seminary. Our Episcopal brothers and sisters are near and dear to my heart, and I continue to work with our local Episcopal parish in the setting that I currently serve. But not only uh, that setting. I also work in an interfaith environment in Plainview, Long Island, where 60% of the population is Jewish, and with our brothers and sisters there, although we cannot agree upon the Messiahship of Jesus, we can agree upon the love of God and the promise of of God's presence with us. So as a bishop, I uh, can't believe I'm saying this, but I would bring this love of Jesus to this office. Thank you. Pastor Stewart. Thank you. Uh, Okay, I have to admit right from the get-go, I am not a purebred Lutheran. Sorry about that. I hope I still have some credentials, although I do love the coffee thing. That's great. I am probably as mongrel as it gets. My mom was raised Methodist. My dad was raised Episcopalian. I was baptized congregational, raised Methodist, and went to a Lutheran college. Okay, so I'm really confused here, but that's okay. Confusion's not always bad. The world in which we live is absolutely shrinking. It's becoming more and more connected. We're becoming more and more connected with each other. There are so many, so many things that are afflicting our world. So much brokenness, so much pain, hunger, violence, injustice, you name it. And who better to address those issues than the body of Christ, those of us who love and follow the one who himself lived in poverty, and died in violence. But us Lutherans need some help there. We can't do this alone, and so I think it's critical that we talk with, that we continue to have strong, hands-on relationships with our sisters and brothers of other denominations, not just talking theology. Theology is really important. I get that. But when you've got a hungry person or you've got a person who has no shelter over their head, they don't care what your theology is. They need your help. And Jesus absolutely didn't do the denominational thing so much. 
So, what do we bring as Lutherans to the ecumenical table? I think, above all else, we bring the story of a God who gets down and dirty with the human race. We talk about incarnation so well. We talk about a Christ who has come not only to pitch a tent among us like we hear in John's Gospel, but we hear about a Christ who heals, who teaches, who suffers, who goes into the broken places, not tied down by denominational lines. Us Lutherans, we talk really well about a suffering God. So, that's what we bring to the table. We bring to the table a God who gets down and dirty with us, or as um, my wife likes to tell me, we, we like to go back to the 70s and we were big Doobie Brothers fans, and she said, you know what, this is not me, this is Pastor Joanne. She said, you know, doing ministry is like that old Doobie Brothers song taking it to the streets. That's what it's about. And you know what? If we're going to be a church that's relevant, that has a message that says we, we don't talk about love, we live love, then let's take it to the streets, but let's not do it alone. Let's do it in conversation, in dialogue, and let's join hands with our, with our ecumenical brothers and sisters in Christ. Thank you. Pastor Machols. As Dean of the Genesee Finger Lakes Conference, I've had the privilege um, and pleasure of working with my counterpart in the Episcopal Diocese of Rochester, Julie Sikora, who is canon for mission and ministry, specifically in the area of campus ministry at the Rochester Institute of Technology and regarding the South Wedge Mission, a mission which is fairly new to our conference that we are working to uh, accompany and help grow. In my conversations over the years with Julie, she has said to me more than once, you know what I like about your Lutherans? And I'm sorry about this, Doug. I love your theology. I love your understanding of justification by faith and your understanding of sanctification by the power of the Holy Spirit. I love law and gospel and how you expound upon that and make it central to what you do as God's people as Lutherans. She has been a partner in this process for me for the past couple of years as we have worked and will continue to work together moving forward. I think we do bring a theology. We bring a theology of a cross where we all stand at the foot of that cross as beggars, seeking the salvation and the hope and believing beyond belief in a grace that comes from the crucified and resurrected Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. That is what I, if elected bishop by the power of the Holy Spirit, would bring to the church. The ecumenical church is a church in progress, coming and continuing to understand one another and the unique gifts that we each bring to the table as we work for the sake of that gospel and the good of all humankind. It is a gift that God has given to us, it is a prayer of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ that they all may be one, even as the Father and I are one. Is that oneness attainable in our lifetime? Probably not. But that should not stop us from moving forward toward working toward the prayer of our Lord as he prayed to his Father on that night in which he was betrayed. I would bring a strong theology of the cross grounded in the baptism which is ours in Christ Jesus, filled with the promise of life in this life and new life for the world to come. Thank you. Bishop Yergi. Good morning again. To the ecumenical conversation, probably the thing that I must bring at this point in time is just a lot of experience. I've served as the president of the Council of Churches, and in that setting, I think what's been most exciting for all of us working together has been when we dig into scripture together to listen for God's call for mission to the world. I have been a person who has brought text study to the council table so that we're not just doing kind of businessy structure stuff, but that we're really listening together for that call. 
when we do advocacy in Washington, when we call on legislators, it's that shared understanding of the word and the richness that it brings when we listen to each other. What Lutherans bring is an incredible understanding of, as John said, the theology of the cross, but also of this law gospel distinction. And as we have conversations, we're discovering that there is so much that binds us together. And yet we all come at it with a little bit different perspective. And that enriches us rather than diminishes us. I think the other thing I'd like to um, share is the whole sense of um, our longing for unity that goes even beyond the Christian uh, denominations. My hope is that our ecumenical relations will also reach hands across to the other Abrahamic faiths, to the interfaith dialogue that needs to happen. Um, I think we're engaged in both. I think we have been enriched enormously by the uh, full communion partnerships that we have, by our brothers and sisters here or serving in Lutheran congregations. We get to be better Lutherans because they are asking us questions and because they are challenging Oh, some of those stock phrases. What do they really mean for us? So what we bring is an openness to dialogue, a longing for unity at the core based on our love of Jesus together. Um, and then this, this constant desire to search and explore and discern what God has next in store for us. And I think we do that best together. Pastor Walter Peterson. I want to tell you a story. For the last seven years, I have spent about a month each summer teaching at St. Leo's Coptic Catholic Seminary in Cairo. It's the Egyptian Catholic Church that trains young men to be priests in Egypt. And about four years ago... I was there at the seminary teaching for a month um, when they also had guests, all the other seminarians and priests uh, from Italy who were visiting them for a few weeks. And as I walked one morning, it was a Friday morning because I was on my way to preach at the Lutheran parish in Cairo, I had my collar on, I was walking down the hallway, and I saw one of the Roman Catholic priests approaching me from Italy. And I was so certain what his reaction was going to be, that he was going to walk the other way or something. But no, he approached me and said, oh, Who are you? What are you? Tell me about you. He was so eager to learn about this woman with a collar in Egypt. And so that began between us a conversation about what does it mean to be one in the body of Christ, and what does it mean to brothers and sisters of Jesus? Teaching at the Coptic Catholic Seminary in Egypt, not only has it been a life-changing experience, but it has been a faith-building and just an entirely world-changing experience for me. Um, I have been privileged because of my presence in that community and because of the ways that my brothers in Christ and the Coptic Coptic Catholic Church have received me not just as a teacher, but because they have received me as a pastor in their midst, they have invited me and allowed me to preach in their daily Mass. Last summer, for the first time, one of the priests who teaches at the seminary, I, well, they let me eat the bread of Jesus every morning in the daily Mass. There is no separation. There is oneness of Christ in that place. But last summer, one day at the seminary, as I came forward for my, my body of Christ, as I do every morning, the priest who was presiding that day held out the patent for me, as he would for any priest that was his brother, for me to take the body of Christ. That is only a gift that comes to us when we have the humility 
to recognize the face of Christ in our neighbors. Time. Thanks. Again, would you thank the nominees for their participation in this process? I invite the pages to distribute the ballots for the third ballot for Bishop of the Upstate New York Synod. Again, voting members only at the white tablecloth tables, visitors at the blue tablecloth tables. Again, on this ballot, it will take 60 percent of the votes cast for there to be an election. If there is not an election, the top three will continue on to the fourth ballot. I'm, we'll, we'll get to prayer here in a moment. I'm, don't vote. You, we, we need to get a credentials or a registration report, and we need to get prayer. But I decided this time I'm going to wait and let them have the ballots in front of them before we uh, just start doing the stuff. The, the, I know the, the assembly manager is going, what is he doing, and would somebody please get him under control? I understand how that works. So to calm Patsy's heart, can we have a report of the registration You have more fun, but you also have some issues here about making sure it's done right. <laughs> okay, so our report for the third ballot is we have 417, that's 417 voting members for the third ballot. And the pages remind me again to ask you, I think I did, but I'm going to ask you now forcefully, if you are a voting member, you must be seated at a white table in order to receive a ballot. So if you are currently at a table with a blue tablecloth, you will not get a ballot. Please move to a white table. Uh, and okay, you're going to be doing our prayer. Let me, again, do not vote yet. When you vote, you will check, or excuse me, you will X in the box. One box only. If you do it multiple boxes, raise your mallet so it can be replaced one box only, and uh, then we will collect them as we have. Before you vote, let us take time for prayer. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, the evangelist Luke tells us that the eleven asked you to show them the one you chose to fill their numbers as a witness to your resurrection. And they cast lots to add Matthias to the number called as your apostles. Today we cast ballots to call one among us to serve as the bishop of this synod. Guide by your Holy Spirit the decisions we make together. We pray for all voting members. We pray for Marie, John, Eric, Douglas, and Amy. We thank you for their ministry and presence among us. Help us discern your choice in this process. Make it so we may say, it seems good to the Holy Spirit and to us, as we humbly and prayerfully cast our ballots, seek your will, and move forward for the mission and ministry of your church. In your name we pray. Amen. Does anyone need a ballot? Please allow prayer to have a ballot. Everyone has a ballot, then I invite you to vote the third ballot for the office of bishop. When you have completed your ballot, do not fold it, pass it to the right, and the pages will collect the ballots. Has everyone completed voting? I declare the third ballot for Bishop of the Upstate New York Synod closed and 
invite Bishop Yergi to return to the chair. You met him last evening, but I would like to introduce to you Pastor Chris Berger, who is our churchwide representative this year. He serves as secretary of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America for the churchwide report. Pastor Berger. Thank you, Bishop Yergi. We, we talked about whether we should tap dance, soft shoe, or how we should do this, and uh, we'll continue to do it some more. But, you know, given the spirit of the assembly, I think we could have done something like that because uh, it's a most... Uh, fun-loving group from what I can see. Okay. Uh, in the spirit of fun, I started this in the Eastern Ohio Synod because uh, a certain bishop had been elected from that synod so that she could see what was happening in her former synod, and she liked it so much, I'm now doing it everywhere. With my phone, I can now do a panoramic, panoramic picture of this assembly. So if you would like to wave at the presiding bishop, put your hand up, and we're going to take a picture here. It's not a motion picture, so if you're...